I'm going to let you in on an open secret. I have no talent in mixing music or t-shirt design. I cannot do an English accent, Irish accent, or Afrikaans accent to save my life. Nor do I have the vocal range to give you the deep-voiced opening you hear at the start of each episode. The good news for me is there is always Fiverr. Fiverr.com allows you to hire freelancers for sometimes as little as $5 to do tasks that you have to get done for your business or sing happy birthday to your spouse in ways that are impossible for you or honestly, the list could go on. Help yourself and help the show by using the link I provide in the show notes to see if Fiverr's freelancers can help you or if you have anything to offer Fiverr. My show was not possible without Fiverr. Some meaningful work in your life may now become possible with Fiverr. Go ahead and open the link in our show notes right now. Now, on to our show. This is Forgotten Wars. The Boers fired the first shots and took the first prisoners at Krypon Railway Station in Bechuanaland. This fit part of their overall strategy. Cut off avenues of any future British advancement along South African railways. The Boers aimed to disrupt the railway line at Kimberley, Freiberg, and Mafeking in the Cape Colony as well as Ladysmith and Northern Natal. So... They aim to prevent easy British transport into the Boer Republics from the south and the east, to prevent the British from easily moving reinforcements within South Africa. Attacking Natal also held nostalgic appeal to Piet Jobert, Piet Cronier, and Christian de Vette. These veterans of the First Boer War, the Transvaal Rebellion, remembered all too well the success they'd enjoyed in northern Natal's Drakensberg mountain range, at Langsneck, at Machuba. At the Natal colony's governor Sir Walter Healy Hutchinson's request, and against the wishes of General Buller, Major General Sir William Penn Simmons moved about 4,000 British forces farther inland from Ladysmith, the headquarters of the main British force in Natal. These British forces at Glencoe and Dundee gleamed as a target for Boer forces. But there was at least one other reason Natal looked so attractive. President Stain. President Stain showed reluctance to go to war as quickly as Creer wanted. Stain showed little enthusiasm for launching a huge invasion of the Cape Colony from his much closer free state. You see, W.P. Scriner, the Cape Colony's prime minister, and Sir Henry de Villiers, Chief Justice of the Cape Colony, had both worked hard to help the British and the Boer Republics find a peaceful settlement. Though this work ultimately was in vain, this earnest work made Stain less than excited to blitz into the Cape Colony and wreak lots of collateral damage. Stain's reluctance to launch a major invasion of the Cape Colony from his closely situated free state added all the more to the gleam of Natal as a target. So thousands and thousands of wars amassed along Natal's border. Jobert led 14,000 Transfallers, while General Martinez Prinzlua led 6,000 Orange Free Staters. These commandos brimmed with excitement, the sort of excitement that many men can scarcely contain at the beginning of so many wars in human history. One of the commandos was the son of Transfall State Secretary Francil William Wright's son. Years later, Denise Wrights wrote about the days leading to this invasion of Natal, about how so many men, and he, only 17 years old at the time, felt, quote, As far as the eye could see, the plain was alive with horsemen, guns, and cattle, all steadily going forward to the frontier. The scene was a stirring one and I shall never forget riding to war with that great host. It has all ended in disaster. And I am writing this in a strange country, but the memory of those first days will ever remain. 
Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire. But that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks. Act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. We mentioned at the end of the last episode, by way of Pakenham, that the Boers besieged the Cape Colony mining town of Kimberley. The siege began October 14th, two days after the attack on the Crypon Railway Station. The siege on Kimberley also began in pretty undramatic fashion. Part of the reason for this is that the British really fortified this town with forts and redoubts making a seven-mile circle around Kimberley. All this, not to mention forts, searchlights, and watchtowers near Beaconsfield and De Beers Mine that added another defense line of 14 miles. The only way to take Kimberley would be to charge with a large force across flat, open ground and suffer heavy casualties in the process. This was not the Boer style, to charge into heavy gunfire and risk heavy casualties. The Boers kicked off Kimberley's siege by cutting the town's telegraph lines. Colonel Robert Keekwich proclaimed the next day that residents had to stay inside their homes from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Martial law was on. Imagine that you're a Kimberley resident in church when you hear this news. Hear from the diary of Elizabeth Atkinson as she writes about that October 15th day. Quote, Now we are besieged by the Boers. And though no one thinks they will take Kimberley, there is enough danger for us all to feel that we are really amidst the sound of war's alarm. And we have really had war's alarm. Last Sunday morning, the war signal, a fearful hooter used in the Kimberley mine, sounded in church. And after the prayer, all the men left the church. We stayed a while, but were manifestly uneasy. And eventually the service was brought to an abrupt conclusion. And we were in the streets and going to the nearest quarter for news. This was very conflicting. And you would be astonished now if you could have seen the place to which we wended our way. The gardens, the gates of which Agnes made several copies, are now occupied by the imperial and volunteer troops. Tents rest in every direction, and patrols are stationed at every point. Martial law is proclaimed and all have to be in their houses at nine o'clock unless they wish to be arrested as spies, end quote. Colonel Keekwich commanded just over 2,500 troops at the onset of the siege, with less than 600 being from the British Army. The rest of the troops were local, inexperienced troops from Kimberley and Beaconsfield. By the end of November, Keekwich commanded over 4,500 troops charged with defending Kimberley. About 50,000 people populated Kimberley at the time. 13,000 whites, 7,000 coloreds and Indians, with 30,000 blacks making up the vast majority. General C.J. Vessels led the 4,800 Free State Boers who began besieging the town. 2,200 of General Cus de la Rey's Transfallers joined the besiegers a couple weeks later. Historian Franz Johann Praetorius writes the following about the way the Boers besieged Kimberley. Quote, If the Boers had moved swiftly, they could have taken Kimberley at the outbreak of hostilities. But they were tardy to arrive on the scene, and then did nothing other than breaking up the railway and communication lines and cutting off the town's water supply from Riverton in the north. The initiative was thus shifted to Keekwich, who used the opportunity to increase his garrison with civilians and make useful reconnaissance trips. On October 24th, this led to a skirmish when Major H. Scott Turner took a mounted force and an armored train on a sortie toward Riverton. The Boers lost two men killed and seven wounded, while the British suffered three men killed, three officers, and 18 wounded. 
On November 4th, Vessel sent an ultimatum to Keekwich to surrender unconditionally, offering an opportunity for the women and children to leave the town. But the offer was summarily rejected. End quote. Now listen here for the aggression that Vessel showed. Quote, Not prepared to take the town by storming it, Vessels resorted to the occasional bombardment. The heaviest shelling occurred on November 11th when five guns fired about 400 shots, most falling harmlessly in the Kimberly Hole or in the streets and killing one black woman. End quote. There is more to say about the siege of Kimberly later, but you can also refer back to episode 1.1 to hear some more about Kimberly's siege in the meantime. Now we are going to shift to a scene involving Winston Churchill. If you would like to help keep Forgotten Wars producing and growing, would you do at least two of three things? First, would you share a link to the podcast with someone you think might enjoy it? Second, if you're listening on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or other providers, would you make sure to like or follow our podcast? If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, would you give us a five-star rating and write a thoughtful review there? You can even do that while you're listening. Lastly, if you want more from the show, bonus episodes, behind-the-mic access, transcripts and sources, and much more, and you want to support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash forgotten wars. That is patreon.com slash forgotten wars. The link is also in this episode's notes. Thanks to those of you who have done one of these things already. Know that you're appreciated. Now, back to our episode. The Dunotar Castle sailed from Southampton, England, on October 14th, after the Boers sent their ultimatum. A young war correspondent from the Morning Post tried to pick the massive brain of General Redfur's Buller during the 14-day voyage. To be clear, General Redfur's Buller did literally have a gigantic head. Now, that young war correspondent who was interviewing Buller is the Winston Churchill you've all heard of. Churchill, the war correspondent, did not share the same fear of the British soldiers aboard, that the war would already be over before Buller and company arrived at Cape Town. No, Churchill didn't expect to be home until the spring of 1900. Churchill didn't think the Boers would fold after their first defeat. On the way, the Dunotar Castle received word that the Boers had indeed invaded both Natal and the Cape Colony, that the Boers had laid siege to Kimberley with Cecil Rhodes still inside the town. Pakenham describes the ship scene further, quote, Buller himself seemed calm and detached. To Tory politicians, accredited war correspondents, and even Buller's own headquarters staff on the ship, the so-called brains of the army, the general's aloofness seemed almost like arrogance. It was a flaw in his character, though common enough as a form of shyness and a flaw that tended to make him enemies in high places. Perhaps what especially irritated such people was that towards strangers, and especially to ordinary working folk, he showed no such reserve. You can catch me if you can, but I won't pose for you, he playfully told the man with the mutograph sent to cover the expedition for the Biograph Film Company. Then he let the man catch him several times over, strolling across the deck in his bow tie and straw hat on the way to the barber's shop, and cheerfully shoving the white-whiskered captain of the ship into the path of the camera so that he too could have his turn. The general is a gentleman, sir, the barber told the cameraman afterwards. Just think how easily he talked to me, Yes, he did all the time he was having his hair cut. And when a man came in for a pipe, and I told him to come later, the general up and said, Why give him his pipe? I'm in no hurry. On Sunday, October 29th, two days before they were due to dock, they saw a small tramp steamer, which turned out to be the Australasian, heading away from the Cape. She altered course to pass close to the Dunatar Castle. She must have left Cape Town three days earlier, and must have news. A rush for the rail followed. Buller himself emerged from his private saloon on the lower deck, and the biograph made its third capture as he raised his field glasses. 
a storm of excitement. What was it to be? War? A truce? A war surrender? As the Australasian foamed past without slackening the speed, people saw a huge long blackboard hung on her rat lines. Chalked out on this were the words, Wars defeated. Three battles. Penn Simmons killed. There were no shouts in reply, just a shocked silence. For both pieces of news were bad. The death of the general and the likelihood that, by the time they arrived, the war would be over. End quote. Winston Churchill wrote about receiving this news of Penn Simmons's death in his book London to Ladysmith via Pretoria. Churchill wrote this about Sir Penn Simmons. Quote, Sir Penn Simmons is killed. Well, no one would have laid down his life more gladly in such a cause. Twenty years ago, the merest chance saved him from the massacre at his San Juana, and death promoted him in an afternoon from the subaltern to senior captain. Thenceforward, his rise was rapid. End quote. Churchill then writes of Simmons's successful command of troops fighting in India's mountains around 1898. Churchill interviewed Simmons during that campaign as well. Churchill writes, quote, I used often to meet him. Everyone talked of Simmons, of his energy, of his jokes, of his enthusiasm. It was Simmons who had built a race course on the Stony Plain, who had organized the Jumrood Spring Meeting, who won the principal event himself to the delight of the private soldiers, with whom he was intensely popular, who, moreover, was to be first and foremost if the war with the tribes broke out again. End quote. What Churchill, Buller, and the rest of those aboard the Dunotar Castle saw crudely etched in white chalk was all they knew about Penn Simmons's death and the now ongoing South African War when they steamed in to Cape Town. When they reached Cape Town on October 30th, they all were disabused of the notion that the war would be over quickly. Churchill sets the scene for what happened at 11 p.m. when a man who knew stepped aboard their ship. Quote, the man told his story quickly, with an odd quiver of excitement in his voice, and the audience, perhaps we were 300, listened breathless. Then for the first time we heard of Elon's Lochter, of Glencoe, of Ritfontaine, a tale of stubborn, well-fought fights with honor for both sides, triumph for neither, end quote. Buller received further, more private briefings of what had happened at the Battle of Ladysmith and at Nicholson's Neck. So what had General Buller and Morning Post correspondent Churchill missed? Five days into their voyage, on October 19th, General Lucas Mayer led a night march from Buffalo River with the hope of seizing Talana Hill and Lennox Hill east of the Natal town of Dundee the next morning. Then the plan was to attack Major General Simmons's camp situated west of Dundee. From Mount Impati, about 5,000 yards north of the Simmons camp, General Daniel Erasmus would support Mayer's attack. So what actually happened? Simmons started by digging his own grave. The Boers had just occupied the Elon's Lochter station and cut off the railway, the roads, and telegraphic communications. Historian Franz Johann Praetorius writes that Simmons neglected all precautions and refused the advice of Lieutenant General Sir George White to retreat to Ladysmith. Simmons basically dared the Boers to attack his position, not thinking that the Boers would actually attack a full British brigade. Simmons didn't even bother to order his troops to dig in or construct any effective cover. What followed is what many call the first major battle of the South African War, the Battle of Talana Hill, a.k.a. the Battle of Dundee. When General Lucas Mayer's men unexpectedly ran into a group of Royal Dublin Fusiliers at 2.30 a.m. on October 20th, Boers and warriors of the British Empire exchanged the first shots of the Battle of Talana Hill. One sergeant from this British patrol managed to slip back to his garrison commander and warn about the strength of this large Boer force. 
Simmons brushed this warning aside. Mayer, on the other hand, continued to act decisively. The Boer commando split into at least three groups. Mayer led one group to take Lennox Hill and Smith's Neck. Major Jan Volmerans led another group with four artillery guns up the eastern side of Talana Hill. Major Volmerans' force began bombarding the Simmons camp at 5.50 a.m. Just before the bombardment, Boer artillerymen watered or, quote, lay the skins of freshly slaughtered cattle under their concealed Krupp howitzers to minimize the dust thrown up on discharge. Just before Simmons could eat his breakfast, the first shell struck. The shelling caused confusion, and only one casualty, at least according to Pakenham. To let you in on a term I use next, Brother Boar is how many British officers referred to their enemy. Brother Boar's shells rarely hit their targets in Simmons's camp, and rarely exploded even when they did hit the rain-softened ground. One boy bugler of the 69th Battery did get his head blown off. Then, British artillery south of Dundee retaliated against the Talana Hill artillery and shut the Boer bombardment down. By the time all 18 British artillery pieces were in action, over 1,000 panicked Boers flew into retreat. Simmons then launched a frontal assault on Talana Hill a hill that was pretty assailable. As his mostly raw recruits, who had never seen action before, marched into position, some eased the tension by cracking jokes. Others could only grow pale and swallow hard to hide their fear. End quote. I don't think I would have had the presence of mind to crack jokes at this point. Colonel Bobby Gunning told his NCOs all together, Now quietly, lads. Remember Machuba, God and our country. The nearby hill of Steel Cool Sprite contained a cleft with perfect cover for troops preparing for an assault. Praetorius describes the scene further, quote, Halfway between the Sprite and the summit, at about 1,000 yards, a plantation of eucalyptus trees and outbuildings of Smith's farm gave further shelter. The hill itself comprised a series of terraces with dead ground between. Furthermore, a low stone wall running parallel to and just before the topmost terrace would afford breathing space before the final onslaught. At about 7.20 a.m., the infantry advanced by half companies in extended order from the Sprite, still partly mixed, the Dublins on the left and the King's Royal Rifles on the right, while the Irish Rifles were held in reserve. The Boers, who had spread out along the crest of Talana, opened fire with their Mausers from between 1,200 and 2,000 yards. End quote. This is so striking to me. Some of these riflemen could actually hit targets from 12 or even 20 American football fields away. Amazing. Back to the Praetorius account. Quote, this was the first experience of the massed fire of modern rifles in the war. Wow. However, the open formation afforded enough opportunity for the men to reach the plantation with relatively few casualties. A long halt followed, the battalions getting thoroughly mixed as everyone sought cover, but some companies of the rifles and Irish fusiliers moved to the right to respond to the heavy flanking fire that had opened from Lennox Hill and most of the Dublins shifted to the left into a donga running up the face of the hill. End quote. To be clear, visualize a donga as a deep, dried-up river. So imagine these Dublin fusiliers getting fired on and running or even jumping down into this donga with steep sides providing the fusiliers cover. The British artillery moved to another position again at 8 a.m. between Dundee and Steel Cool Sprite. They concentrated their artillery's firepower on the crest of Talana Hill and on Lennox Hill, but couldn't drive the Boers away. The British troops were on the receiving end of magazine fire for perhaps the first time in British military history. So the British forces still had not taken Talana Hill. British artillery had not come anywhere near suppressing enemy fire, 
despite officers on the ground, through the mouth of Brigadier General James Ewell, suggesting that the British wait for the artillery to do more damage, Simmons refused. Simmons personally trotted by horse to the gap in the stone wall that he wanted his men to charge through, and decided to lead by example. He dismounted from his horse and strode forward with his scarlet pennant being carried behind him by an ADC. Pakenham writes, quote, There were times in the wars of the 19th and earlier centuries when a general had to sacrifice his life to rally his men. It was the counterpart picture to The Last Stand, the death of the general at the moment of victory. Perhaps Simmons saw himself in this noble tradition. At any rate, he now had to pay with his life the price demanded. After a few moments, he returned through the gap in the stone wall and stiffly remounted with the help of his ADC. When Simmons was out of the sight of his troops, he let himself be taken by the Indian stretcher bearers to the dressing station. Major Kieran, commanding officer of the 20th Field Hospital, found him there in excruciating pain. End quote. Major General James Ewell took command and continued the charge. Praetorius writes, quote, On the left, the Dublins were soon checked, but with their officers leading the charge, companies of the rifles and Irish fusiliers reached the wall just before the topmost terrace of Talana, amid accurate Boer rifle fire from the crest. Some lost heart halfway and doubled back to find cover. Two hours passed as the troops behind the wall waited, while reinforcements came up from below. At 11.30 a.m., the guns ceased their fire and allowed the infantry to rush the crest of the hill. The rifles, Irish fusiliers, and Dublins all formed part of the final onslaught, the rifles supplying the most men and losing most heavily. Colonel Gunning, who had gallantly led the attack, was killed as he reached the crest. On the hilltop, only the bravest wars remained, standing stubbornly until the last moment. End quote. So imagine that you're a British soldier who has survived a brutal charge through the first high-volume rifle fire of the war. You've seen your general be escorted off the battlefield. Maybe you saw your colonel at the head of your charge drop dead in front of you. But now, you've finally done it. You and your fellow soldiers have reached the last of the wars who wreaked so much misery on you and men you have trained with, marched with, and just now bonded with through a deadly and harrowing morning. Then you're struck through the knee by a war bullet. Then a bullet goes right through your back and out through your right thigh. Then another bullet strikes very close to your spine. You still manage to crawl to the top of Talana. Finally, the wars are gone. Perhaps you're elated, relieved, triumphant even. You start to bandage your leg. Then, shells start striking all around you at noon. To your horror, you realize but can hardly believe that your own British artillery is shelling you by mistake. You and the rest of the victors now have to retreat from the crest you just risked and lost so much over because your own side is accidentally firing its artillery on you. Man. As you flee the hill, you see the boars you just drove off start to retake their original spots on that hill you just fled. Then you and your fellow British survivors have to turn back around and retake that hill. Imagine that you suffer a mortal wound in the process just before your side finally retakes the hill at 1.30 p.m. The Boers took their time retreating to Lana Hill and Lennox Hill, but the British artillery didn't strike those soldiers. Praetorius writes about the aftermath, quote, The British certainly paid the penalty for Simmons's arrogance in approaching the battle lightly. However, Mayer's choice to be a mere spectator from a safe position on Lennox Hill and Erasmus's unconvincing excuse that the thick mist on Impati made it impossible for him to cooperate, cost the Boers the battle. The British casualties were 446 officers and men, 10 officers and 31 men killed or died of wounds, including Simmons, who died three days later, 20 officers 
and 165 men were wounded, and nine officers and 211 men were taken prisoner. It is probable that 44 Boers were killed or died of wounds, and 91 were wounded, giving a total of 135 men. Two days later, Lieutenant General George White ordered Major General Yule to retreat to Ladysmith, to which he gladly agreed, due in part to the lack of cooperation between Erasmus and Commandant Johann Weilbach of Heidelberg, the inclement weather, and White's sortie to Ritfontein, Yule's force succeeded in reaching Lady Smith safely on the morning of October 26th. End quote. And so our story of the first major battle of the South African War ends. Now that the show is over, I'm excited to tell you that the website got a wonderful overhaul, complete with, among other things, a new look, a new blog, and even a resource to help my fellow social studies teachers. I would love it if you'd check out these changes at ForgottenWarsPodcasts.com. I'm telling you this on February 24th of the year 2021, so if you are listening to this a few months or years later, well, I hope you enjoyed the new look already. Take care.